Um, all right, well, why don't we get started? Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, full disclosure, this is actually our first formal webinar. So if there's any technical hiccups, please, uh, please forgive us. We're doing the best we can here. But um, I'm really excited about this. This is obviously a topic that is on a lot of people's minds. And I'm really excited to have our distinguished guests here talk about what they're seeing. So just to kind of set the tone, um, you know, housekeeping stuff should be pretty straightforward. Um, you're more than welcome to submit your questions in the panel at any point. Um, we will reserve the bulk of responding to them towards the end of the discussion, but certainly if there's ones that are that we see that are very pertinent, um, it's not a problem to interject mid conversation. Um, so, and, and the call will be recorded and we'll make everything available online uh, probably by tomorrow. And so uh, feel free to sit back and relax. And so you can watch the video again later at your leisure. Um, all right, so thanks again, everybody. Um, I think we all know why we're here. Uh, basically, I think for everybody in attendance, our world just recently flipped on end and we're all trying to figure out what's happening. Um, what's the best way to respond? Do we need to respond? Um, clearly, the way we all work is fundamentally gonna shift. Some things will be temporary, some things will be permanent. And we all obviously have businesses to run, um, families to um, take care of. And so we're trying to just figure this out. And I think a lot of us are going through a lot of the same experiences, have a lot of the same questions. And so I thought this would be a nice opportunity for a handful of people to get together and try and come up with some answers together. Um, so what we're gonna be diving into is certainly, you know, what is the actual impact? Um, what types of companies are being hit hardest? Um, who's not being hit? You know, what's happening in the supply chain that's probably changing pretty quickly week by week. And trying to come up with a list of what are some of the right things to do or not do to respond to this. Um, and so just to get the ball rolling, let's go around the, the room and do some introductions. So uh, our first guest, Bob Brakeman. Hello, everyone. Um, Bob Brakeman. I am down here in Los Angeles in the Southland. I'm currently running operations for an industry 4.0 tech company called Elementary Robotics. Um, before that, I ran the JVL Emerging Tech Unit, the JET Unit at JVL in San Jose. I've been working in manufacturing supply chain, usually with early stage companies for about the last 20 years. Great. Thanks, Bob. I'm glad you can join us. Paul. Thanks. Uh, let me start out by saying that I hope that uh, everybody that's joining us today is safe and healthy during these, uh, these trying times. Um, I'll start out a bit by talking a little bit about what ONTAP does. Uh, we offer consulting services to large and small companies, um, but one of our specialties is helping early stage companies navigate through and manage the complexity of uh, manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, and sales. So that's that's a kind of point of view that I'll bring to today's discussion. So for me, um, the last 35 years or so leading up to the time that I joined on TAP, my time has been equally spent between a large multinational companies and startups. Started my career designing integrated circuits for general instruments, spent about 10 years uh, with uh, digital equipment and six years with 3Com where I was director of materials for uh, West Coast Manufacturing. After 3Com, I started my startup journey and uh, worked for companies like Access Land Communications, Good Technology, and Stoke. And um, currently I'm working uh, with clients in lots of different areas, but specifically consumer electronics, mm -hmm. IoT sensors, and medical devices. Great, thanks Paul. Um, and so many of you already know about Duralabs, but those of you who may have joined from some obscure link, uh, I'm Michael Kaur, co-founder and CEO of Duralabs. Uh, we're also down in Los Angeles, and we are a leading provider of cloud-hosted bomb management and PLM software, specifically focused on teams that are implementing more agile practices. So we feel that engineers should be focused on engineering work, not data management. And so by leveraging a lot of the incredible um, uh, uh, 
improvements in the agile software workflow, we're bringing those technologies into the BOM and PLM management space. So uh, I just got informed that there's a little technical hiccup that we can only see one person at a time. So give me one second to see if I can change that. Uh, don't quite know how. All right, well, we're gonna have to just work with that. Um, all right, let's dive in. So um, first off, I'd uh, love to go around the room and just hear you know, what you guys are currently seeing today. Um, what is the snapshot of the supplier status uh, worldwide from what you are currently seeing from your uh, responsibilities? Uh, Bob, you wanna take that one? Sure, so if I had to sum it up in one word, I'd have to uh, use the word unpredictable. Um, what we've seen in the last few months are some suppliers have been completely or minimally affected by the coronavirus, both in the U.S. and, and suppliers in China. Um, some have been completely knocked out and have closed the doors and notified you know, their, uh, their customers that they're, they're out of business for at least the next three to four months. So it's really been unpredictable. Logistics uh, has, has thrown an entire another level of complication into, uh, into the mix as well. So this is not the time to take your supply chain for granted. It's definitely the time to get on the phone with your suppliers and figure out where they are and what's going on with them and uh, talk to them often as their situations are changing, changing on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So how frequently are you actually talking to your suppliers? Are you calling them, emailing them? I'm trying to call at least once a week. And I've found, especially with suppliers in the U.S., that with so many people working uh, from home, that it's it's really greatly appreciated to make that that personal phone connection, and it's uh, it's really been productive in in keeping those relationships strong and viable and communication flowing. So you're always up to date because a lot of your suppliers they're getting updates from from their suppliers on a daily basis, and things change. And it really uh, makes things a lot easier when you're talking regularly and, and keeping in the mix as to what's going on with them. Nice. And just Paul, what are you seeing? Yeah, just to add to that, Michael, um, I think it's useful to use 2008 as a little bit of a, a reference, specifically the recession in 2008. And during that time, we saw lots of suppliers kind of reduce their capex, which um, reduced constrained supply and had an upward pressure on pricing. I think given the uncertainties that we're seeing uh, in the overall global economy, um, we should expect those kinds of things, uh, particularly from uh, the commodity type suppliers for memory and for passives. And, and I think that they're not only gonna be uncertain about uh, capacity increases, but they're, they'll be slow to, to bring new capacity online um, in the interest of um, you know, firming up the pricing for their products, right? So I think everyone should brace for that. I, I've certainly started to see a little bit of um, upward price uh, pressure on things like flash memory. And, and I suspect that it'll be more wide, it'll come more broadly. And are you seeing different responses for different part categories? So ICs versus passives or mechanical? Yeah, I think the, the thing that I'm watching most closely are the commodity driven types of components, right? Specifically memory, uh, DRAM and flash, uh, as well as passive components. And what about regionally? So clearly, you know, China was hit first and that's them being the, the major manufacturing region in the world. Um, but where it is on the street that they're starting to recover and that factors are coming back online. Is there a ripple effect across different regions in the world? You know, I think the dependence that we all have on South Korea <laughs> can't be ignored. Um, you know, specifically um, Samsung's capacity there and in their capacity in other places in the world. Uh -huh. So uh, I think that's a, a place to watch closely. And Bob, what are you seeing? Well, um, you know, probably pretty much, you know, along the same lines, we're seeing a lot of um, not a lot of price increases in a lot of our commodity products, but definitely shortages. And what we're seeing is a lot of larger companies uh, panicking and buying large inventories, buying up inventories that are out there in anticipation. And I think in, in some cases, the anticipation of, of shortages or upward um, price pressure is actually creating a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Uh -huh. 
yeah, I, I think that'll happen in the short term, but I think, you know, it's probably going to stabilize out a little bit more quickly than, than people think it will. I think factories are going to come back online in, in uh, shorter amounts of time than was initially anticipated just, you know, six weeks ago. Six weeks ago, everyone was assuming China was, uh, you know, going to be offline almost in its entirety for the next three or four months. So they're already starting to perk back up. And we're seeing suppliers, uh, you know, requote lead times that went from two weeks to four months back down to two months. So I okay. think it's just So lead times are coming back down. Yeah, yeah. I think people were, were estimating based on worst case scenario, but it's not quite as bad as I think some people thought it was going to be. Got it. And do you feel that suppliers are being genuine? So Paul, you made an interesting comment. Are suppliers falsifying their shortages to increase prices or do you think they're being genuine and really trying to be supportive of their customers? Oh, I, um, I didn't mean to imply that anybody is falsifying their, their status. Um, what we had seen in the past is, in, is uh, very selective CapEx kind of investments. And you could imagine that if uh, you were part of the decision-making uh, process at any large multinational supplier, you'd want to understand more about how the global economy was going to shake out before you made those CapEx uh, decisions. Uh -huh. Right. So I think to a certain extent, and, and Bob touched on this, um, you know, the, the shoe hasn't dropped yet, right? There's a lot of uncertainty, right? I mean, there's been just this last week, there have been 6 million uh, unemployment claims, right? It's unprecedented, right? Um, yeah. Do we really know how that's going to affect um, our suppliers in, in the global economy? Um, I think it's still a bit unclear, but using, using the past as our guide, um, you know, in, in, in the spirit of planning, um, um, planning for the worst and hoping for the best, I think we're going to see spot shortages in certain commodities, and, and there'll be that upward um, uh, pressure on pricing that comes along with it. Sure. And so, shifting a little bit, do you see certain OEM categories or statuses being affected differently? So, we've already gotten some guidance from people like um, Apple and NVIDIA that, you know, gives, uh, would, would give some credence to the thought that, um, uh, consumer products are going to be impacted. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, data enterprise data centers and in broadly um, businesses that support people from working at home are getting a little bump right now. Um, so, um, in, I would suspect, right, given the, the level of unemployment in the U.S. and throughout the, uh, the world that um, there's going to be some softness in the automotive industry as well. Huh. And what about cycles in production? Do you see any differences between companies who are still in early stage design versus prototype pre-production or mass production? Are some of them safer than others? Well, I think they have different needs, right? Um, what we're advising all of our startup clients is to uh, work really hard to uh, manage uh, expenses and manage costs, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean laying people off or, or, or cutting, uh, cutting back on uh, all expenses. It just means um, that we're recommending that they uh, look carefully at things like logistics. And for many of our clients, that's low hanging fruit in that when we come in and do a close look at their logistics, we're able to find some uh, pretty significant cost reductions. Uh, and, you know, like avoid, um, adding fixed costs, right? And, and you know, uh, favor variable costs uh, to solve specific problems as they occur. Uh -huh. And what about prioritizing costs? Um, certainly cash is king right now and people are trying to figure out where to prioritize. Um, there's always been this underlying problem uh, or, or balance of inventory. So it may be Bob, you can, you can talk to this. So, People, operations people are always trying to balance how much inventory do I keep on hand to be able to supply um, customer orders quickly versus having cash on hand. And so I'm curious if you're, you yourself are changing your strategy at all um, with this added pressure to reserve even more cash. Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely going to have uh, this is the current global situation an effect on how you know, companies, especially smaller companies, are going to be... Um, you know, implementing operational leverage strategies. But, 
um, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to have that much of, of an impact, especially for early stage companies. We're definitely looking at, you know, harder to, uh, to get components that we either single source or have a limited number of purchasing options from and carrying those in um, higher quantities. And um, it, it also, you know, hedging our bets with finding some alternatives. So I think one of the, the better strategies that, uh, especially an early stage company can take advantage of. And early stage companies, I think, are in a lot of ways a much, in a much better position to weather this kind of a storm because you, you are early stage, you do have the flexibility, you don't have large uh, ongoing manufacturing lines with, um, you know, hard commit dates for, for shipping product and you have a lot greater ability to be flexible to and, and moving and setting up your su supply chain. But I think what uh, is this is going to drive um, this is going to drive a lot of is design review. Um, at the end of the day, uh, your your product design has a huge impact on your supply chain strategy. And as we we see some parts become harder to source, I think people are going to be going back a step and looking at their designs. Uh, again, especially early stage companies and start looking at ways of designing out single source uh, products or um, difficult to find components mm -hmm. and start looking for those that are more, uh, have more resilient supply chain behind them. Well, it seems, I mean, those are best practices anyway, that, you know, any yeah. robust team should be implementing, but understandably some people, you know, in, in, in the interest of speed to market, we maybe not spend as much time as we have in the past in finding those alternates, but it sounds like now there's even more pressure to do so. Yeah, it's the same, same basic strategy, just a little bit more obvious and a little more pressure to move in that direction at a, a sooner stage. You have thinner margins, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just a quick break. Um, I want to actually turn to the audience and just have a simple poll. I'm just curious to learn more about who's in attendance. So we have a, a quick poll here just to understand where you are in your own product life cycle. Um, so I just launched that. And if you don't mind, I'd just love to hear from you guys. Just fill in uh, your company. Are you in design, prototype, pre-production, mass production? And we can certainly gear the conversation more uh, in favor of the majority of where our audience is at. And Michael, maybe while we're waiting for those results, one of the, the points that I wanted to raise related to inventory is that, um, you know, for many companies, finish, too much finished goods inventory is kind of like the kiss of death, right? particularly for uh, products that are, you know, early stage and, and are going to be subject to kind of um, a fast cycle of changes. Uh -huh. so for, you know, for people that uh, are concerned and are feeling that they need an inventory position, uh, you know, we're recommending uh, to first look at um, inventories of raw components uh -huh. as opposed to developing inventories of finished goods. That obviously gives you a lot more flexibility in many different ways. Uh -huh. And if need be, you can certainly more easily um, liquidate the raw parts than the finished goods. Okay. Okay. Um, wow, I've never seen this before. So the results of the poll are exactly even. So everybody's in design, prototype, pre-production, mass production. So it's good to know, but doesn't skew our conversation in that way. Okay. Um, all right, moving forward. So here I can share the results. Oh, actually, I guess some last minute votes put us into the design and prototype. Some more early stage companies. Good to know. Okay. Um, all right, well then that's really relevant in terms of some things we're talking about now. All right, so uh, to move along. So how, I guess first question uh, on the next topic is, you know, obviously everybody's responsible for the success of a company. Everyone has their responsibilities and their roles, what have you. Um, for this topic in particular, in terms of responding to what's happening in the manufacturing industry, who would you say is the primary person who really should be on top of this and starting to at least make the recommendations, if not have the authority to give the go ahead? Either one of you, go ahead. As, as far as internally, who are the- Yeah, sorry, and on, on an OEM company. So I imagine, 
you know, especially many early stage companies, there's already, you know, probably a high percentage of inexperienced people with manufacturing and it's not a criticism, it's just more of a, a state of fact. And so some people may not even know whose responsibility is this to respond to it and take action. And so there might be some things that are starting to slip through the cracks and obviously speed is crucial. So who would you guys recommend should be spearheading any kind of response to, to what's going on? Yeah, so my uh, personal thought on that is that these types of decisions, because they do touch on a lot of disciplines, both you know, engineering, you know, strategic sales operations, that um, it really needs to be a shared information group decision within an organization, especially a, a small organization where everyone needs to be you know, uh, part of that, that decision and take their, their part of the ownership of it because of the, the impact that it does have, especially on a small company. But I think that going through uh, a situation like we're going through right now, especially with, with teams that maybe haven't gone through multiple development and product release cycles, this is a really great learning experience and opportunity to mature your management team. Because if you go through this experience together and you're all sharing thoughts and information and everybody's bringing in their experience, I think it's just a terrific way to get global management level uh, exposure to what it's like to have to make supply chain decisions and what the impacts are. So I really think of this as a, a, a great potential learning experience uh, within a company that will hopefully you know pay dividends in the future when supply chain is a little bit easier to uh, to manage. Everybody's on the same page and understands group strategies and it's working together. What about you, Paul? As as obviously a consultant to help companies with their manufacturing, are they all counting on you to make these decisions? So typically the decisions are made by in operations or hardware leader uh, yeah. at our clients. Um, we with all of our clients, we, we stay really close to the problems that they're facing and help provide our advice. And, um, you know, we've got really deep experience with, from people that have been in the industry for a number of years. And some of these things have been played out before. You know, we touched on uh, the fact that there are some, some guidance that we could get from the 2008 recession that may be applicable today. Um, but I think... I think Bob hit it right in that um, many of these decisions can't be made in a vacuum and they're, they, they, they've got to be led by somebody, but they also have to be team decisions. And, and the team really has got to be not only within the, the organization of the OEM, but um, you know, bringing suppliers in and staying close to what's happening with suppliers. Um, you know, I'm particularly worried about small contract manufacturers, particularly in China, it's been a really tough year for those guys, right? Because uh, you know we had the shutdown right after uh, Chinese New Year, and then there's the shutdown uh, that's occurred as a, a part of the coronavirus. And in some parts of the economy, um, you know, the orders are slow to come in. So I think you know bringing that data from having detailed conversations with suppliers into teams and getting broad perspectives to make uh, these kinds of decisions are going to be super important. Sure. So having more conversations more frequently with your suppliers. Yeah. What about diversifying? So that too has always been an ongoing trade-off, you know, for building your supply chain. So obviously, you know, everyone understands, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Clearly a lot of people got hit by that. If all their suppliers or manufacturing were in one location, um, and so diversifying, you know, having a mix of suppliers, you know, regionally, not just backup, but just having different regions uh, in your AVLs is certainly on paper a really good strategy. But in practice, again, for smaller companies or earlier stage companies, it has a lot of overhead to it. Um, the redundancy, the multiple next to choke, you know, lots of different communication, the coordination, shipping costs might obviously go up if you're doing you know, sub-assemblies in certain regions and then shipping for final assembly in other places. Um, how do you think this pandemic is going to change people's perspective on diversifying regionally? Bob? Yeah, so um, I, I think that's a really great question. And, you know, you know previously, you know, there's always been 
this trade-off to say going to uh, to manufacture in Asia. There's you know a, a quantifiable measurement of of the cost to manufacture in the U.S. to the cost to manufacturing in Asia, and and that quantifiable cost delta has always appeared more uh, to more than compensate for the risk factor. I think what we're going through right now, we've had such a dramatic binary shutdown of China going completely offline for even a short period of line, especially in conjunction with it happening just at uh, the time of Chinese year when everyone was away from factories, that we also now have a quantifiable financial impact of that, that, that risk should China shut down. I, I don't think anybody uh, well, we, all, we always said that it was a matter of uh, when, not if, when something like this happened, but I don't think anybody really anticipated it. But now that it, it has and we have a quantifiable measure of the financial impact on, on a company, I think it's going to be the same process. We're just going to have better numbers of what it looks like in making that, uh, you know, those decisions about how we implement, implement our supply chain and make it resilient. Is there greater overhead? Absolutely. But at what point does that overhead um, is, is it worth it compared to the risk? Well, we now have a much better answer for that than we did this time last year. So you think some people might look past the fact that manufacturing in other regions could be more expensive due to labor rates for the added risk reduction? Now that now there's actually an empirical experience and in, in, in something they can point to, it's not hypothetical anymore. Exactly, exactly. We already live in a global integrated supply chain ecosystem. Um, EMS factories in, in the U.S. and in California are impacted when California goes down because we get all of our components there. So it's an integrated you know, ecosystem. So I don't see complete forklift chains of, changes of uh, you know, supply chain uh, to the U.S. or to a particular re region. I think we, you continue to source components from different regions and maybe move your FATP, your final assembly, you know, back to the U.S. But I think um, one of the things that we're going to see is, and I think, uh, you know, Lior Slusen from Eclipse Ventures posted on LinkedIn a week ago that this coronavirus is the start of a 20-year trend in reshoring. And I, I think he was pretty, pretty close to that. It's probably more two years than 20 years. But I think we're going to see a lot of manufacturing. Uh, that, that new number is going to tip the scale back uh -huh. to manufacturing locally, uh -huh. at least it will still be tied to the global supply chain, but yeah. it's going to be the scale. And I think you're going to see a lot of factories um, putting a lot of incentives out there and taking advantage of it, trying to bring manufacturing back, especially with early stage companies that haven't committed to overseas factories or made those capital investments in the manufacturing lines. And you're going to see them investing a lot of next generation manufacturing uh, industry 4.0 technology, like, huh. like, Robotics makes for quality control around the AI and computer vision systems, and Arch Systems makes in um, data analytics and 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 monitoring. And you know these are some cutting edge technologies. I think there's now a much greater market for than there was this time last year. That's interesting. Um, I want to get back to that, but I want to hear your perspective, Paul, on regional diversifying. Yeah, I mean, so China has been under pressure for quite a while now, right? So starting with the trade issues with the US and that's caused a lot of people to look at alternatives and um, you know, they were particularly hard hit for the coronavirus, right? So I think, I think that what that means is, um, you know, at one point in time, many people just fled to China because they thought that was the only solution that made sense, right? <laughs> um, and I think there is no, no magic solution because what we've seen with the coronavirus um, many, many regions have gotten um, hit and are uh, struggling in various ways. Mm -hmm. But I think and I hope that this brings us all back to fundamentals, right? And when you're choosing a contract manufacturer, you look at things like, um, you know, volume, the stability of the product, mm -hmm. proximity to end customers, uh, cultural fit, uh, all of the um, freight costs, all of those kinds of things and, you know, make your choices between China, Southeast Asia, the United States and Mexico. And, 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 and I think I agree with Bob and, and I hope that this is going to be the case that, um, you know, people will take a closer look at U.S. manufacturing because there's a lot of great solutions there. Sure, I agree with that. Um, the next topic I want to get into is, is new tools and new concepts that have come about 
you know, because of this uh, the new pandemic. But before we get to that, I want to go back to the audience and actually have another um, poll specifically about what are your current pain points? You know, what's on the top of your mind? What are you most concerned about? Um, if you all can take a moment to respond to that, we can certainly begin addressing um, our perspective and, and views for any common pain points. Um, so while we're waiting for that, what I'm really interested in and curious about is, you know, the phoenix. What's going to rise from this? Um, the good stuff when all is said and done. Are there going to be new tools, new processes, new business models? Um, across the board, you know, just the, the first focus I would think of is, you know, in response to diversifying, obviously that, in, in, you know, creates a lot of overhead. And so it puts more pressure on an operations team to manage multiple suppliers at once, you know, in the interest of being more robust, but obviously that creates a lot more work. Um, do you think there's going to be new tools or new workflows that are going to help support this new workflow or, or, or in general, any other new tools or business models that you think might be necessary? You know, I think, yeah. I, I think the fundamentals haven't changed, right? And, um, you know, for people, uh, so like managing, managing your, your bills of materials and your suppliers on spreadsheets, I think works for a certain point of time, but you know, as things get more complex and as you get closer to shipping product and as you become under scrutiny from, uh, from customers, um, you know, more sophisticated solutions, I think, are absolutely required. Um, particularly as, as it, since people are going to be in, more interested, I think, in mapping supply chains, right? Like, not only understanding what's happening with your direct suppliers, but also understanding what's happening at the suppliers to your suppliers and understanding what the, the points of risk are, you know, using some more sophisticated tools, I think, can only help with that. And do you think those tools exist today or they need to be created? Um, I, 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 think, I think they have varying capabilities at varying price points, right? So, um, so yes, I, I guess the short answer is that uh, to a certain extent that they exist today. Okay. And what about you, Bob? What are you thinking? No, I, I would agree. I know it's, it's kind of a, a shameless plug for Dural Labs here, but honestly, without um, I mean, the the ability to go into Duro and to search on a um, manufacturer part number and three, see three or four different suppliers and get up to date pricing and such, you know, these tools, especially when you know resilience in the supply chain is going to be such a hot topic. For a while, I mean, it, it always has been. It's always been part of a good strategy, but more obviously now, uh, tools that um, uh, allow for collaboration, on online uh, tools that can be shared amongst teams, and you know, especially now, um, with in our case, our entire team is working remotely from home. And we're, we're using tools like Duro and Google Hangouts and Zoom and Google, Google Docs. Um, a lot more, well, obviously at this point, ubiquitously. But I say, you know, even beyond the, the process of, you know, how, you, how are you managing supply chain and suppliers and all, uh, one of the things that we've really lost a, a lot of is that human connection of, of having, you know, the close proximity of operations and engineering to, to know what's going on, you know, on a day-to-day day -to -day or hour-to-hour -hour basis and kind of be on top of it or up to date with it. And, and, and also just losing that, you know, human communication. So I think, you know, a lot of the video conferencing tools that we have really coming into their own. And I mean, and you know me, I'm not good with technology, but even I've learned to use Google Docs more or less. So, you know, um, yeah. It's the way we we're, we're doing business now in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of really good stuff going on here. Um, I, I want to continue on that too, but to go back to the other digression. Uh, so the poll, I'll end the poll now. We've got some good responses, but there's definitely more obvious leaders on this one. So um, what we're seeing here is the biggest concern, the biggest pain point is supplier lead times. Um, and I imagine that's either the, the increasing or just the uncertainty. 
um, followed by accurate pricing and availability reports. So I guess that makes sense. Um, part prices themselves or manufacturing lead times are, are lower priority and finding alternates, actually that's surprising. That was a, a lower response, only 22% people felt that was uh, a big pain point. Um, so to, uh, another quick housekeeping thing. So, you know, the, the, the phone lines are open. So if people have questions, please feel free to start submitting them um, and we'll start to respond to them. I see a couple have come in already. Um, definitely start getting to those and just let me know if it's just a general question or if it's one for uh, a specific panelist. Um, so let's talk about supplier lead time. So earlier on, um, Bob, I think you said that they did go out, but you're starting to see them come back in. Um, do you think, what do you think is going to be the average lead time, you know, in the next, for the next month, for the next six months? Do you have any predictions on that? Obviously, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm not sure I, I'd say there's going to be anywhere near an average that you should be able to calculate because it's going to be all over the place on a, on a, a supplier by supplier component by component basis for a little for a little while. Some suppliers will, you know, the capacity is already there. They'll be back up to speed pretty quickly. Some are going to be knocked out for, for a little while. So as far as, you know, being, you know, where are they going? You know, that's really going to be a, you know, something you're going to have to drill down to supplier by, by supplier mm -hmm. um, and dig into because that's, that's going to be a hard one. And then there are so many moving parts when it comes to a full supply chain manufacturing solution. There, it's not just parts and component suppliers. Um, you know, your plastics manufacturer is dependent on the resin suppliers and we're all you know, dependent on logistics, which has had a monkey wrench thrown into it um, recently as well. And then even if you can get all your parts, your, 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 your suppliers are, you know, in China, we're under lockdown for a while. And now in the U.S., they're uh, closed up and under lockdown for a little bit. So the hard part is going to get all these moving pieces coordinated into a nice fluid manufacturing cycle again. And, and it's, going to, it's just going to be a lot of legwork to get that uh, back in place. And so with, you know, the rule of thumb being that standard lead times for volume parts is eight weeks. Do you think that that baseline is going to change, Paul? Do you think maybe the baseline will now be 12 weeks or 16 weeks? Um, you know, to a certain extent or to a large extent, we're in uncharted territory, right? None of us have ever seen what, what, um, what's happening right now. But I think it makes a lot of sense to look at what we consider cyclic kind of commodities, right? And I'm thinking of memory, I'm thinking of passives, um, to a certain extent, printed circuit boards, and to just watch those uh, with the expectation that there's, there's going to be some pressure for lead times to extend and prices to go up. Uh -huh. And it's better to be prepared for that, to watch and be prepared for that, as opposed to being prepared, uh, assuming that everything will, will be just fine, right? Yeah. I, I think everybody's got to be vigilant in that respect. And so by vigilant, you mean people being more on top of checking price and lead times more frequently, talking to their suppliers? What does vigilance mean in that context? So in any component shortage situation, the, the people that uh, are able to understand the trend and move quickly and get in the front of the line will always do best, right? So you know, I think it goes back to the fundamentals that Bob mentioned at the beginning of the call, right? Be talking to your suppliers often, talk to your contract manufacturers often, talk to your global commodity managers at contract manufacturers, and just be aware of, of the trends and be ready to move on selective kind of strategic purchases uh, if things are moving in the wrong direction. So let's talk in terms of more uh, like actionable things that people can take. So like short term, um, what are some of the things, you know, the takeaways if someone's, if you were to put together a checklist or a punch list, <laughs> you know, what, what could people do short term to certainly stop any bleeding or, you know, stop, you know, their supply chain falling apart and not being able to go into production. And then like over time, so we've already established that certainly keeping communication lines open with all your suppliers is good, but let's just say you get some report in from your supplier that something's changed. How do you respond? So let's say what, like, what are some of the short-term things, Bob, that you have done with your company specifically? 
I think uh, one thing that is important is you're not going to stop the bleeding. You're going to slow it because where we are globally, there's going to be bleeding. Mm -hmm. It's just how much you can control it. And, and again, it really comes down to the fundamentals of getting on the phone with your suppliers, remembering that your, your manufacturing supply chain lead time is as short as your longest lead time component and getting ahead of those and find out what is going to be uh, the shortages uh, you're going to have, what's going to be in short supply for the short term, for the long term. And a lot of times your suppliers, if you talk to them, will have insight to that. And, and then, you know, I think it's important, one, you know, don't panic. Don't make any really big moves in your supply chain. Initially, while everything is in uh, turmoil, don't make any expensive changes. Don't do any, any knee-jerk, you know, purchases for large amounts of inventory or what, what have you. But do be vigilant. Get on the phone. Figure out what this problem parts are going to be. Find alternative sources for them or uh, design them out with more available components. And, and basically, it's the same fundamental strategy that we'd all probably uh, you know, implement from the beginning. It's just a lot more imperative now because the supply chain is a lot, more forgi le a lot less forgiving. Mm -hmm. yeah, so focus, go ahead, Paul. Well, I, I, I agree with what Bob said. And, and I would add to the equation looking uh, very carefully at your contract manufacturer, particularly if you're uh, working with a small one. Because um, we've already seen um, tier ones like Flex, Jable, and San Mino warn that their earnings are going to be down going through this year. Uh, as a matter of fact, Wistron and Taiwan claimed that their revenues were going to be 20% uh, down 20% this year compared to last. Right, so these guys are big enough where they can survive this, but I'm worried that smaller contract manufacturers may not. Right, so so what do you do? Right, you keep your ear close to the ground to really understand how well your CM is doing, mm -hmm. and then um, you know I'm a big believer in always having a plan B. Right, like the last thing you want to do is run into a board member in the hallway of your company, and he says, uh, "Hey, um, you know, how are we impacted by the coronavirus?" And you don't have an answer, right? So, uh, and a plan B can be just understanding what um, you know, what other alternatives you may have, and talking mm -hmm. to other contract manufacturers, and just kind of thinking, gaming through kind of like the worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of a game theory, like thinking ahead what could go wrong and trying to prepare for it so let's just say then you know uh six weeks from now eight weeks from now you know things are starting to hopefully to stabilize um and then all of a sudden one of you you're in a weekly call with your supplier and one of them says you know what like you know their own supply or their own workforce or something happened and their lead times just went from 12 weeks to 50 weeks Bob, you had said things like don't take knee jerk reactions, but let's just say something like that comes in or, or you know, uh, another likely event is maybe the prices change. So like we're, we're sorry about this, but we have to double our prices for you. How do you respond? You know, he, those, those are difficult spots to be in and, and things that, you know, we've experienced firsthand. We saw our, our supplier in uh, South China for PCB fabs um, go from with lead time to two weeks to you know within a week said just assume four months from this point uh, on until we tell you differently but we found another you know supplier in South China uh, competitive that was, was shipping still at, at two weeks lead time so I think the, again the important thing is you know don't panic these things do happen you have to roll with it just figure out what the the challenge is and get on the phone look for alternatives or alternative components and, and manage it on a item by item, case by case basis as, as you would anything else. There's not a lot of, you know, else that you really can do, but take it one problem at a time and solve it. Is it worth OEMs to go through their MSAs, manufacturing service agreements with their suppliers and see if there's anything to renegotiate or you think leaving the MSAs and, and any other terms as status quo is okay? It depends on the nature of the MSA. You know, um, most MSAs have covenants for force majorum acts of God, which this would definitely fall into the current situation that we're in that allowed for renego renegotiation. But um, I, I would say it's probably 
uh, you're probably better off relying on having a good relationship and good communication with your supplier and working with them to make sure that everybody stays healthy and whole than trying to revert to the terms of an MSA or just an MSA. Um, that takes a long time that there's a lot of overhead associated with it and it's uh, a lot of times easier just to get on the phone and, and work it out with you know the people on the other end. Okay. Any thoughts on that Paul? Yeah I, I think the general principle of um, if you need an adjustment to your business terms, you should ask for it, always applies, and now and in particular, right? And that doesn't mean that you should just wholesale, kind of like throw the MSA out the window and do whatever you want. But, you know, the thing that I would encourage to everybody that's on the call is that uh, if you're having particular difficulties in, in uh, any specific area and you need some help or relief from your suppliers, you know, may it be a, uh, payment terms or forecasts or pricing and stuff like that. Um, don't hesitate to put it on, on the table um, because, you know, most suppliers, they're probably, if, if you're feeling it, they're probably hearing it from other customers too. Right. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing actually that's been puzzling me. So I, uh, you know, my background, I used to be in, in, in your guys' shoes, you know, designing and manufacturing hardware and in the lab and, you know, on the plane to China and what have you. Um, I love building things, you know, keeping my hands dirty and, and it's a lot of fun. And now my career is taking a slight shift of I'm now building the tools to help people like me that, you know, do their job better. And so I'm not on the front lines as much anymore. And one thing I'm really puzzled about is with this work from home policy, Software companies, probably very little impact, right? Some logistics, some efficiencies, what have you, but the, the, the mechanics of writing software you can do from anywhere in the world. Hardware, you need access to a lab or to the physical product. And so I'm curious how you guys are adapting to this, you know, so that you don't completely stop your development. Um, do you take turns in the lab? Like, do you, do you mail prototypes around to your team? Like talk to me about what you guys are seeing or some best practices that some other teams can implement or yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. We, we have started, uh, I think, well, first of all, I think everyone has um, more or less a demo unit in their home to work on and we've gotten everyone's home address programmed into all of our uh, supplier address lists and we're shipping directly to people's homes and just making the best of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's well, right. I think, um, I think people are still trying to figure out the, the current situation and, you know, particularly as it applies to small companies, um, yeah. there's always been a sort of work at home ethic and, and people have been doing that to certain degrees, but, um, you know, to a large extent, people are still figuring it out. Yeah. It's curious. Maybe that's, you know, uh, maybe we'll see a boost in AR or VR technology to help people troubleshoot or, you know, play with the, the hardware. Um, all right, well, we're, we're certainly getting to the end of the hour and I want to be respectful of people's times. So we can start getting to some of the questions that people have submitted. Um, if you haven't submitted a question yet, please feel free to do so now. Um, all right, so no particular order. Um, mainstream media suggests many small companies will go bankrupt from a supply chain management perspective. What can we do to protect our continuity of supply? <clears throat> so I think the, the key thing here is to um, uh, manage expenses, right? Uh, particularly for small companies, because you know it's it's not uh, it's not clear how venture capital will respond to uh, the current situation, but it's fair to assume that um, it may be more difficult to raise the next round. So what does what do manage expenses mean? Uh, you know, like. Um, you know, use, use um, like, don't invest in um, fixed costs, right? And, and look at variable cost solutions to solving problems. And then also look at reducing expenses. And, and like I said, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, for a lot of our clients, um, looking very closely at logistics costs, um, we found is often very low hanging fruit. And it's something that could deliver pretty short term results. Uh -huh. Um, all right, another question came in. Uh, is it riskier to change suppliers than to ride out delays and the extended lead times? 
I guess it's like, it's the devil that you know. Do you keep where you're at or do you jump? I would, if I could uh, feel that one, that's a really good question. Uh, there's always going to be an associated cost and risk of changing suppliers. It really comes down to how much do you have invested in your current supplier with regard to CapEx investments, training, um, intellectual property and tribal knowledge that's been accumulated and and what is the time and cost impact of moving to a new supplier and what is the long-term benefit my my first uh, thought is don't make any rash changes you've already made an investment in their relationship and the the manufacturing um, resources that you and and don't just uh, panic and 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 move because you're you're feeling a short-term pinch because whoever you move to is going to be feeling a similar pinch. Let's say you've really got to put a lot of thought into that before you make make any moves and really weigh that out carefully. That's good advice. Yeah. Um, all right, here's one for each of you. How have your specific businesses been impacted overall? If you have any anecdotes you can share. I guess it's a general question, but uh, if there's any, any, any highs or any, any like good experiences or uh, that have come out because of this? I would say one thing outside of supply right. chain that we've really noticed is we're a small, small company. It's a very tight knit group that gets along extraordinarily um, well and does a lot together um, for you know, team lunches and such. And one of the biggest impacts is that we've had is I think culturally in the fact that we're all now working remotely and it's a lot more difficult to kind of maintain that uh, that daily communication and those those touch points that I think we've all become used to and really you know dependent on uh, um, as far as our communication processes. I think that's probably to a great extent uh, been more noticeably impactful than the you know, the physical you know constraints of of uh, working from home. Yeah. Paul, are you seeing an uptick? I imagine a lot of people are looking for experts like yourself to help them yeah. navigate this. Yeah, we're expecting an uptick, and we've seen we've seen a little bit of an increase in activity. But you're correct in times like this, um, particularly. Um, so, so people are looking for advice, looking for people that have gone through it before, uh, looking for solutions that represent a variable cost as opposed to a fixed cost. So. Um, yeah, we're, ex you know, we, we're expecting a, an uptick in our business. Sure. Um, all right, here's another one. Uh, you guys have done a great job at talking about what things to do. What about things not to do? No finished goods inventory. It, yeah. it, and I don't mean no, but I mean, um, you know, if you're feeling compelled to invest in finished goods inventory, take that step very, very carefully. And don't base it just on cost and demand, but also um, look carefully at the stability of the product that you're investing into. Because one of the one of the, the worst nightmare scenarios is lots of inventory of an unstable product that has to go through multiple rework cycles. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'd add to that. Uh, stay away from CapEx right now. Like. Um, Paul said, you know, variable costs are the way to go. Stay away from the big investments. Uh, this is not the time to buy a $400,000 Stratus 3D printer when you can order parts through a exometry or a, a commercial supplier. Uh, hold on to your cash, be smart, be careful, and uh, move methodically and slowly. Um. Any other questions or topics you guys want to bring up? Um, we didn't talk much about freight today. Um, for um, everybody, should expect that that whole industry is going to be quite unsettled because there's not only a shortage of capacity due to passenger airplanes not flying and, and passenger ships not sailing, but um, you know, things, simple things like um, checks at border checkpoints, like health checks at border checkpoints are causing huge delays. And also we're seeing that um, uh, distribution warehouses that are having a hard time getting people to come in to work 
uh -huh. are causing uh, huge delays as well uh, to the point where warehouses are running out of capacity. Um, so uh, just be really weary of that and, uh, and watch it closely because it's something that right now, not a lot of people are talking about, but it'll have a big impact to many businesses. Uh, and I'd, I'd add, add to that that I think it's going to become very attractive to start working with suppliers that have resources in multiple um, regions of companies like uh, there's KS Plastics out of Fremont that can do injection molding in California. Um, with a couple of, of plants in the Bay Area that have resources in Mexico and China, and it's all run under one um, corporate umbrella. And suppliers that have those kind of capabilities and the internal resilience are going to be a lot more attractive moving forward. So if something like this um, happens again, you have some alternatives without uh, completely switching suppliers. And I, I completely agree with what Paul said about a lot of smaller players, a lot of smaller CMs having a lot of price, pre price pressure and they're gonna take some real hits um, from losing business for the next six weeks and may have some, some CapEx uh, um, limitations and some working capital uh, challenges. And I would be willing to bet that you see some of these smaller players start to get uh, purchased up by bigger players, expanding their, their footprints to cover more regions especially in the Los Angeles area. So you think there'll and, be a, a handful of mergers and acquisitions between suppliers? You start to see roll-ups where people start hedging their bets by making sure that they have coverage in multiple re regions moving forward so they don't get hit and lose all their uh, business and revenue streams from one regional event. That makes sense. So suppliers are diversifying themselves as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so just to wrap up before we uh, hit to the top of the hour. Um, since both of you have crystal balls and can predict the future, um, paint a picture. What's it gonna look like, you know, in the next month, three months, 12 months? Are we gonna see stability? Are we gonna see a whole new world? Are we gonna see instability? I think the next three months are going to be painful. Okay. A year from right now, we will all be looking back on this with regard to how we operate businesses and supply chain and manufacturing, a whole lot more educated and experienced from a, a rapid learning curve. Uh -huh. And we're going to see probably much more better put together supply chains, strategies out of, out of necessity. Um, so I'm very unforgiving environment and out of necessity, I think we're all gonna get smarter. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to take at least three months for things to play out and um, uh, may actually get worse before it gets better. Um, and as a consequence of that, there are going to be some suppliers that are here now that won't be here by the time we exit this. Um, and I think that's going to cause people, uh, it's going to cause people to really rethink how they structure their supplier relationships, how they think about second sources, mm -hmm. how they think about geographic preferences. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to um, see what Bob is, is predicting about um, uh, more U.S. suppliers kind of emerging as solutions. Uh, I think that many people will at least take a closer look at, at that. Um, it's not that they're immune to what's going uh, on, but, you know, it's certainly a lot easier to, to drive to the next city or county and sit down with your supplier and get an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball assessment of what their, their health is and things of that sort. And in, in that pays a lot of dividends. And uh, I think it's gonna be um, more in the, the front of people's thinking as we exit this. Cool. Well, um, thank you guys so much. Um, I actually have even more questions, uh, but I, I wanna respect everyone's time. I'm sure everyone has to get back to work. They have other responsibilities. Um, maybe we'll do a follow on in a couple of weeks. I'd love to learn more about your thoughts on you know, manufacturing 4.0 and, and some of the technologies that are coming down the pike. Um, thank you everyone in the audience. Uh, really do appreciate you participating. Hopefully you found this valuable. Um, again, everyone who registered, we will be sending out a link to the recording. Um, and I believe you have my contact information. Should you have any follow-up questions? Um, if you had questions for the panelists, you can certainly forward them to me and then I'll, I'll, I'll forward them on accordingly. But, um, 
we're all in this together. I think this is definitely, you know, a very humbling moment for all of us. I want to believe um, that everybody's having very similar experiences. And so there's a lot to learn from each other. And with obviously the prevalent of communication technology today, I think it's much easier to share these anecdotes and to find these tips and tricks. And so um, Duro is very much trying to participate in this world and be a part of that and certainly be a, a catalyst to help people communicate. And so please always feel free to reach out if you have questions um, and look for other, other topics coming down the pipe. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it. Um, Thanks for putting us safe, like healthy. Yes, thank you. Uh, stay home, more importantly. All right. Thanks, guys. See you.